You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. On the fake, Rodgers lets it fly. Has Watson. He's got it on his feet and he's in for the touchdown. That might be the biggest catch of this young receiver's career for Christian Watson. You can see him. It's just press man. They talk about his speed, his ability to get behind the defense. It's just a matter of can he catch it. That's a great job tracking the ball. He just took a big sigh of relief. Look at his buddies greeting him on the sideline, man. That's got to feel good. What's up, guys? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. And on today's show, we've got a lot to cover. Um, we're going to kind of wrap up the 49ers talk where I kind of touched on their scheme compared to Matt LaFleur's scheme and, and just trying to point out uh, the fact that these two teams are not running the same scheme, right? That they're kind of uh, built from the same core, I guess you could say. They come with the same structure, the same terminology. But Dan Orlovsky actually was pointing out Brock Purdy's play and him being able to identify the defense at the line of scrimmage. And I just wanted to hit on that real quick as we kind of move on from the schematic talk and get into some of the offseason stuff, right? And um, we're going to take it a step further. Some of the stuff that I didn't get to on yesterday's pod. And first of all, the reason you're getting this pod so late today is because uh, obviously Aaron Rodgers was on the Pat McAfee show today. And uh, just wanted to make sure I went late in case some kind of news broke. And, uh, you know, nobody was expecting him to come out with his decision today. But it is the first time he spoke since the post-game press conference. And uh, just wanted to kind of <clears throat> kind of hit on whatever comment he had. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> I want to I want to try to be upfront about this. I had a listener reach out to me and Ryan as well and say, man, enough of the Aaron Rodgers talk. Can we talk about something else? All right. And I'm going to respect that because like everything else on this show, if a listener has a request and I can fit it into the show, I'm going to do that. Right. And, you know, my goal isn't to talk about Aaron Rodgers on every episode. It is the most important decision for the Green Bay Packers this year whether he decides to return or retire. And once he does make the decision, the front office presenting him with the blueprint of, hey, here's how we're moving forward with the team, then he makes a decision there, do I want to be a part of this or not? And then that's when a trade could take place, you know, if possible. I think that's highly unlikely, but, again, everything's on the table, right? Um, so I just want to hit on one comment that he posted, and I'm going to respect what the listener asked me because – I understand, man, when it's when it's drama filled talk, you know, and people disagreeing on this. And, you know, I think Aaron Rodgers is a bad person. I don't think Aaron's done anything wrong, but blah, blah, blah. there's a lot of other things we can dig into. And, you know, yesterday we, we really attempted to do that with the pod yesterday and, and talking about the salary cap. And I've gotten great feedback from that. I'm glad that it helped some folks. I know it helped me having to dive in and study at a little bit deeper level. And it gave me a lot of hope, especially, uh, you know, moving forward, because, again, 2023 is fine. Cap-wise, 2024 looks even better. And um, the biggest thing is going to be, um, are we making a transition to Jordan Love or are we going to draft another quarterback <laughs> if the if the organization doesn't feel like Aaron Love is the guy? Um, after the McAfee show comments from Aaron Rodgers today, I kind of got the vibe 
that the team is probably probably likes what they see in Jordan Love. So all of the I'm looking for these little tidbits and he, and it's just it's not that anybody's saying anything too dramatic, but it's okay. That kind of feels like they're going in that direction. Check it off the list. And it, to me it feels like Jordan Love is going to be the quarterback of the future for the Packers, which is really really cool. Uh, when Aaron decides to to hang it up and um, whether or not Goody decides to tear a little bit more down than Aaron's wanting him to. I'm not going to play that sound bite because it's going to cause a bunch of arguing, and I feel like that's what the listener was um, asking for us not to do. So we're not going to do that. I am going to play one sound bite where he gave a, a shout-out. But let's just kind of get into it. The other thing I'm going to hit on that I didn't get to yesterday was um, the safety market and some of the PFF grades that go with the potential free agents in the safety market, the tight end market, and the wide receiver market. Why? I feel like those are our three greatest needs right now. Hear a lot of people talking about edge rusher, right? And and it is it's it's an elite position on defense. To me, the problem is you've got so much money tied up in Preston Smith and Rashawn Gary. Now, if you want to draft for depth, that does set you up to replace Preston Smith in 2024. Like I pointed out yesterday, he definitely becomes expendable salary cap wise at that point, and he's probably going to continue to to digress, right? I hope that's not the case, but that's probably what will happen. Because, you know, as players get older, it's just – especially at that position, man, you get beat up. And I'm glad Preston got to, got to get two really good contracts, you know. And, and who knows, maybe he comes out next year and he plays, you know, really, really well. That would be great. Um, that's definitely what we need. And we need Enigbare to take a step forward. So, yes, edge is something you want to address this offseason. But I'm looking at filling the starting role the, – the starting roster right now, right? And for me – Defense is kind of on the back burner. We got to get this offense fixed schematically, and you've got to stop avoiding the big issues. And um, for me, that tight end is is the top need on offense. You've got if you can go out and get a player, and I wish it wasn't a Notre Dame tight end because people are going to oh he's just a Notre Dame fan. If it was a tight end that as as I understand right now, he's ranking somewhere around the 16 spot. Some people's got him as high as 12, um, and that's Michael Mayer. Let's say it was some other tight end from South Carolina, wherever, right? If you can give me a tight end that can play inline, he can play flex, he can play the boundary X, um, he's going to block well, he's got sure hands, he's great in space, and, and using his body to position himself to make catches and being able to body defenders. Um then give me him over Michael Mayer, and the Packers may may like a tight end greater than that. You know, the big argument has been, for me, on, on Twitter, people have been saying, oh, you don't take tight ends that early. Why not? Because you can get them later. Okay, so you're telling me that if you could have dropped if – we, if we had known 100% fact last year in the draft with where we picked, we could draft Rob Gronkowski – with that whatever pick it was. Let's say this year, Rob Gronkowski's in the draft. You know you can't miss. <laughs> this is Rob Gronkowski at tight end. Is he worth uh, using the 15th pick on? <laughs> I don't think there's anybody hearing my voice going, no. That and, and that's with the caveat that every other team knows that as well, right? The reason players fall is because they didn't think they were going to be that good. Rob Gronkowski had back surgery, right? That's why he dropped, I think, to the second round, uh, or else he would have been a first-round pick. You know, Tony Gonzalez. Would you take Tony Gonzalez with the number uh, 15 pick? I know I would, right? Would you take George Kittle? I know I would. <laughs> so, to me, that's just kind of a silly argument to to say, oh, well, just because it's a tight end, you take them later. You know, that's like the argument of, well, you can get a quarterback later too. Look at Brady. Okay, who else? Uh, Russell Wilson. Okay, who else? Uh, now it gets pretty slim, <laughs> don't it? So, you know, it's all about the grades that's attached to the players from the front office, and that's going to determine where they take them, right? That and, of course, need. People say that, you know, we draft best player available. That's best player available on the board. That's technically true, but, you know, let's be honest. The board is built based off of need. Scouting uh, assignments are in place based off of need. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean you don't cover every position, but it means – that you're really, really focusing on a select few positions so you can make sure you fill those voids, okay? So let's do this. Let's go ahead and hop over here, and I'm going to share an audio with you guys. It's just really, really cool. This was uh, Dan Arlovsky on Twitter, and he was talking about a play that you guys heard me talk about just the other day, just yesterday, which was a slant to McCaffrey. And I'm going to go ahead and play what he says here, and then we're going we're gonna to hit on it. You know, check how sharp this kid is. Just watch how sharp he is. I can't, 
understate how impressive his thinking is. Okay, so this is like one of those old school traditional under center RPOs where it's pre-snap, post-snap. Now first, watch. When he says old school under center RPOs, to the best of my knowledge, the very first RPO started in Green Bay. And it was Brett Favre and Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson was the backup at the time. They had basically devised this plan in practice that, you know what? Yes, it's a design run, but if they're playing soft and everybody bots on the run, why don't I just hammer this slant in over here on the left side or on the right side, right? The X, the DB's 10 yards off the line of scrimmage. I know we got a run play called. If this backer bots on the run action, as soon as I snap it, if I take a peek, some people call that a peek or an RPO peaky. Some people call it a looky, whatever you want to, you can call it, like I said, you can call it bunk bed. I don't care what you call it. That's where that kind of originated. So when he says these are these old school RPOs, this is what he's talking about. Um, rather than out of the gun, um, which out of the gun gives you a little bit more time to read the defense. But the big thing about the RPO here in San Francisco, and I'm going to talk about it here in a second, is the formation is what really makes this RPO go. You've seen Green Bay do this uh, earlier in the year out of an ace set, where I'm pretty sure it was an ace set where Aaron hammered one into Lazard, and I think it iced the game, which was really, really cool. But again, let me get back to the video here. I just want to point that out. That's what he meant by old school RPO. Just communication. So he's at the line of scrimmage, changing the play. Like, I think he went from one play to another, and he's going back to the original play. Now, this is Debo. Does that sound familiar, gang? Because I had people approach me and say, yeah, if we had Brock Purdy in this offense, the, the Green Bay Packers offense would be way better because Aaron wouldn't be changing the, the play at the line of scrimmage. Aaron would be running the offense that Matt wants to run. Okay, first of all, you don't see Green Bay running 21 personnel out of eye <laughs> as much as you do in San Francisco. Second of all, this is exactly what Aaron's done this year as far as, quote-unquote, changing the play at the line of scrimmage. You come to the line with two plays. What Dan's suggesting is Brock came to the line, he went from one play to the other, so he canned out, and then by the end of it, he went back to the original play. That's what he's suggesting there. But I just want to point out, every not everybody, these people on Twitter were screaming, Brock Purdy just runs the play that's called. If Aaron, if Aaron would just run the play that's called – and, uh, and and stop trying to be a control freak, then the offense would work. Here you see Brock Purdy changing the play at the line of scrimmage twice. Okay, so it's a part of the offense, guys. Now, the difference between San Francisco and Green Bay, spacing, personnel, and these little quick twitch movements before the uh, the ball is snapped, creative ways to put yourself in a in – a, uh, a, uh, a positive hat count, right? So you can maximize the running game. And then, of course, it opens things up in the passing game, too. So. Oh, this is McCaffrey. Okay, cuts. This is the play that was 21 that I kind of referred to as 31 when you think about it because you've got check McCaffrey, and Debo in. Well, Debo's a wide receiver, right? So it's 21 personnel. Debo's in the backfield. He's playing tailback lined up in the back of the eye. And you've got McCaffrey flexed out wide. So when they come out, when they break the huddle, the defense is in their base. They see Debo Samuel go to the tailback position, and they immediately think, okay, they got Christian out wide. Are they going to run a verse? Are they going to run some kind of jet sweep here? Now you're starting to think more along the lines of 31 personnel, right, instead of 21 personnel. Um, it's, it's really, really unique how they've done it. Split McCaffrey has a one-step slant, all right? He is going to send check on just a little bit of a – Hop motion, skip motion. Now Remember me talking about the real quick motions, the quick twitch motions they're using? Work, it worked so well against Seattle. Now, once he goes in motion and you see that one safety in the middle of the field with that cut split and outside leverage here, you really just want to see, does it do anything to this backside backer? If He's talking about the backer that would be considered the wheel backer. The view is from behind the defense. I want to explain this so you guys can visualize it. From behind the defense – the backer that's essentially lined up over the tackle, and then you've got an outside edge rusher over in a wide nine technique, and he was talking about the DB playing outside leverage on McCaffrey, who's in the X there. If he stays, well, this one-step slant by McCaffrey, it's dead. We don't do anything to it. 
But when he hops and skips, if this guy hops and skips with, then you've created a little bit of a void right here. Watch. See his eyes as soon as, go as right soon as there. The, what he's pointing out, so you guys can understand on the pod, as soon as you check, shift it over with that little hop step shift, the backer slides over a full step. Now Purdy's looking at that void going, I'm hammering this slam. Here, look at 34, that backside backer, that backside. And it's a split second before the ball snaps. player. Hop, hop with. Just that is enough. Little pretend toss that way. Bang. Huge. Kick and play, man. He's smart. Love it. So Orlovsky's looking at that play and going, the kid's smart. He can handle it. People on Twitter are telling me Brock Purdy just runs the play. He doesn't change anything at the line of scrimmage. You got to watch the tape, man. You got to. You're missing so much if you don't. You really are. The other thing I wanted to point out on that, and we'll move on, was Purdy tapped his helmet. You guys remember me talking about on Chalk Talk this year. I call them alert lookies, right? Alert lookies are basically you come to the line. If you get the look that you think you're going to, you're going to go alert or you're going to do a hand signal, tap your helmet, Squeeze your right butt cheek, whatever the signal is, right? And that's telling your offensive line through cadence, through signaling, tells everybody, listen, I may dump this slant here. So if you're if you're on the offensive line, do not get caught ineligible downfield because it's essentially a running play that the quarterbacks, everybody on the field thinks that's a running play. McCaffrey's going to run the slant regardless, okay? And the only person that knows truly that the ball's being passed is Purdy. McCaffrey's ready to make the catch. The offensive line knows to stay back, so they do not get caught for ineligible downfield. Everyone else thinks they're running. Now, let's rewind early in the season. What happened? Aaron was doing that, right? And when it worked, nobody said a word. When it didn't work, it was – that was supposed to be a run and play. Aaron's just getting triggered. All he wants to do is play hero ball. He wants to throw a ball. It's a part of the offense. Again, the structure of these two offenses – Everything's in place. It's just the fine details, the personnel packages, the quick twitch hop step shifts, these little things that make a huge difference to get you a hat count both in the running game. And then once you get the running game going, you see a play like this where it forces the uh, the linebacker to take a full step over out of position, and that opens up the looky slant. So I just thought I would touch on that because – you're seeing more and more videos come out on Twitter. You heard Mike Wall talk about the play where I, I had mentioned on the pod where Kittle showed great balance being able to make the block as well as use check cracking back inside. Trent Williams getting outside on the kick block. Um, and now you've got Orlovsky pointing out this play that I also mentioned on the podcast where it was McCaffrey running the slant. McCaffrey split out wide in what you would almost have to pretend like is a, a heavy run play, you know, because Debo can play halfback. Now, that's something we don't have in Green Bay. Right, we thought we were going to have that in our boy Amari Rogers. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, we could put him in the backfield. Remember, we only carried two backs. Well, you've never seen him in the backfield, did you? All year long. I'm telling you, man, this coaching staff—they're they're lost. It's like they don't—they're trying to do too many things at one time. They're trying to well, we want to we want to run out of the gun and we want to run RPO out of the gun, but we also want to mix in power out of a twin ace look. So this lineman, you've got to get to that spot. As we pointed out, Ryan pointed out, they're not getting to that spot. It's almost impossible. Okay, let's mix in some zone. Let's mix in some duo. You've heard Coach Han talk about duo all year long. All these things they are trying to mesh together all at once, and there's only been one person who's spoken out about it, and he got crucified for it. And it was Aaron Rodgers saying, things are too complex. We need to simplify this stuff. And he even said, I can handle it. I, I got it. I'm on the same page. But we got receivers running the wrong choice routes. We got offensive linemen completely blowing assignments on the interception in the fourth quarter against Detroit. What did you see happen? They run a dog blitz right up the middle. A.J. Dillon, for whatever reason, shifted completely left post snap and just let the backer come straight in and peel Aaron's cap. And that's why he just chucked and ducked. Right? Horrible decision. That's on Aaron. I agree with you there. But, man, come on, dude. Like, how, how is it that difficult for A.J. Dillon to just stay at home a split second and and even take a peek? He didn't even look at the inside back. He didn't look at the mic at all and go, oh, he might be blitzing. It was ball was snapped, and he just fanned left. And Aaron's standing there like, what in the crap? Aaron didn't throw him under the bus. Uh, you know, Coach LaFleur didn't throw him under the bus either. What Coach LaFleur said was we had a blown blocking assignment. 
That's all he said. He didn't say A.J. Dillon didn't block his guy. You go back and watch the tape, and everybody went, oh, he was right. That's a blown block. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So just wanted to point that out again. Um, these are the things that I'm going to be covering on this podcast, but it's the little things that make the biggest difference, and we want to catch them as they come and understand it as we go. And let's see what this coaching staff does as we move forward. So let's move on to Aaron's comments. On the Pat McAfee show, Ty Schmidt said he asked Aaron Rodgers about finding positives in a season that didn't go so well. I believe I've got the entire question on here, too. And you'll hear Aaron's response. I thought it was really, really cool. Really cool answer. Let's see what Aaron said here. The Green Bay Packers. Ty Schmidt has a question for you, Aaron. Yeah, Aaron, you look great, obviously. Glad to see you're in good spirits. Um, and I, I – I'll speak for every Packers fan. I don't know if everyone shares the sentiment. I want to say this. I don't know if there's any bad language. I apologize if there is. I tried to weed that stuff out, but I apologize. If you got kids in the room, kids in the car, just be aware, okay? But obviously, want you back next year, the year after, the year after that, well, basically yeah, yeah. until you decide you don't want to play anymore. Uh, when you reflect on the season as a whole, when you're looking back on it, obviously you guys didn't accomplish what you wanted to, but is it easy to kind of pick out and find um, like positives throughout the season? And are there certain things, you know, not asking you to say, hey, yeah, I'm coming back, but are there are there things that you can pick out and be like, oh, you know, like I'm actually excited to, or I would be excited to kind of extrapolate on a couple of these things next year if I do decide to come back and play again? Yeah, listen, uh, there's always positives in the season, and I think it may be a little easier this year because there weren't maybe as many as we've had in years past. We're winning 13 games, and we're the top seed in the, in the NFC. But the beauty in this game is the unexpected surprises and the little miracles that happen um, sometimes every single day, sometimes weekly. And it's those special moments that, that you relish and, and you really enjoy. And to be able to watch you know, so many of our rookies step into – their first year as a professional and to watch their personalities come out as they started feeling more confident and playing at a, at a higher level uh, was a lot of fun. You know, to be able to be there in the beginning for Christian and throw him his first touchdown was pretty pretty cool. And just to watch that evolution from a guy who was really having a hard time catching the ball to becoming a legitimate threat in the NFL, that's so much fun to see. And watching him, uh, you know, progress is going to be fun. Uh, obviously, Romeo uh, had some ups and downs this season, but watching, you know, kind of his confidence come and his character show up was pretty cool. Um, you know, one of the top moments uh, of the entire season was getting to talk to uh, Big Mike. And Hell yeah. I've said this before, but the conversation that we had before the Dallas game, and I see him, you know, chained up and dancing, uh, well, very short-lived dancing uh, post-game. But that was a really, really special moment. And... Uh, that made everything that we went through adversity-wise worth it to be able to have that reconnection moment uh, in person with no cameras, nobody around, and just him and I uh, was was one of the highlights of the season for sure. Hell. Love it. So he was basically asked, you know, hey, um, is it hard to find positives in the down season? Is there anything that stands out to you? And he took that opportunity to basically brag on Christian Watson and brag on Romeo Dobbs said to see Christian go from a guy who was struggling to catch the ball to just he really is emerging as a potential superstar. You know, I don't want to, like, build him up too much, but, I mean, the kid, I mean, he he's he did remarkable things. I mean, you heard me do the episode where we compared his rookie stats to Devontae Adams' rookie stats, and it's like – and that was with Devontae Adams playing an offense where they had, you know, Randall Cobb, Jordy Nelson, James Jones, uh, you know, people like that where they were drawing coverage away from Tay as a rookie. And, you know, it wasn't that they were getting more touches, you know, that that Christian got more touches than him either. Basically, Tay got more opportunities, and Christian did more with less opportunities than Devontae did his rookie year. That's not to say he's going to be, uh, you know, better than Devontae or as good as Devontae Adams, but you got to check the box. So far, so good. But Aaron comes out and uses that opportunity to say – you know, Christian Watson, it was so cool seeing him come out and just blow up. And then Romeo Dobbs battling through ups and downs and seeing his personality come out. It's just, it's really, and you can see him smiling the entire time as he's talking about it. It feels like a player who's wanting to come back and play with this team, which is really, really cool. Now, he went on to make some other comments that I'm not going to play out of respect for the listener who said, man, I don't want to get in a lot because they are. They're going to be comments that, you know, I'm going to, 
I would play the soundbite and give you my opinion. And my opinion would be this is exactly what he said, which is why I'm providing those sound bites rather than people putting a quote up of one, you know, three quarters of a sentence and not the entire, you know, uh, quote itself in audio form. Right. But essentially he was asked about being traded and things like that. And he's like, look, yeah, I mean, anything's possible. Absolutely. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news. So don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as uh, simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. It's only a kick, a jump, a block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle, a run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. But he's got to wait and make the decision, right? And he said the team, and he laughed about it. He said, the team's not put a deadline on when I'm going to make my decision. I'm not going to hold them hostage, obviously. And and pretty much all that he said was, you know, as soon as I make my decision, I'll let them know. Now, he said, I don't want to be a part of a rebuild, right? And, and it's amazing how so many people are trying to run victory laps. Now, See, I told you you wasn't going to be here if they, if they got rid of this one. Yeah. There's no way Aaron Rodgers would return if we're going to tear the roster down like a lot of fans want to do. It's just not going to happen. So, um, you know, he wants to come back with uh, with the players that that we had for the most part. And then obviously, like he said, I'm not, I don't want to be a part of a rebuild. I'd love to be a part of a reload, you know. You put some pieces in place this year. Christian Watson could potentially be a number one wide receiver next year. It's possible. Romeo Dobbs could as well. I think he's closer to a number three than a number one right now. That probably settles settles him in at a pretty decent number two, right? But there's a lot of other players that are going to be free agents this year, and we're going to kind of talk about that right now. But, again, I just thought that was cool that Aaron decided to take that question and put a little shine on his teammates. I thought that was really, really, uh, really cool. So let's do this. Let's move on to the uh, safety market, okay? Um, now, why am I mentioning safety? You know, I've pointed out in the past on, on this show that I feel like safety is the top need on this team. Safety on defense, tight end on offense are the two positions that I really feel like the Packers have the biggest holes in. Okay. So when you look at the safety market, let's just look through at who is on pace, on track to be free agents here in the 2023 NFL free agents frenzy. Okay. At the top of the list, you got Jesse Bates, the third. You've got Jordan Poyer, Jimmy Ward, Adrian Amos, Devin McCourty, Von Bell, Eric Rowe, Jonathan Abram, remember that name, and on and on and on. So let's just stick with the top five right now. They've got listed as the top five in their 2022 annual average salary, okay? Jesse Bates at $12.9 million. Now, we can look at the market value, which I will do for Amos, but I'm not going to do for the rest of them. you got Jesse Bates the third. You've got Jordan Poyer, Jimmy Ward, Adrian Amos, and Devin McCourty. Um, Devin McCourty, 35 years old. Adrian Amos is 29 years old. Jimmy Ward's 31 years old. Jordan Poyer's 31 years old. And then you've got Jesse Bates um, is 25 years old. Keep in mind, guys, this could change. It's why I don't like to spend a whole lot of time on uh, pre-free agency talk 
because they could get the franchise tag slapped on them. A deal could get done here real soon. And we did all that information, all that time on a podcast for nothing. So that's why I try to steer clear of it. But I just wanted to kind of take a quick peek into what the free agent market looked like. Okay. So let's start with Jesse Bates. How did Jesse Bates grade out in PFF? Jesse Bates, according to PFF, graded out as a 75.6. He was the 15th best safety in the league. You guys heard me talk yesterday on the pod about Kyle Hamilton and how I had him number two on my draft board, and I was really I was really hoping the Packers would climb up. He ended up being drafted at number 14, okay? I was kind of hoping the Packers would be aggressive and trade up. Um, I didn't say it on the live cast, and, and I knew that it was going to take a lot of compensation to do that. Now, you don't know where he's going to be taken, so the Packers could have been praying that he dropped to him all the way down, right? But Kyle Hamilton, number two on my board, he grades out as the best safety in the entire National Football League. Guys, he's a rookie. 87.6 PFF grade, okay? But again, the one we just talked about, Jesse Bates grades out as the 15th best. Now, the you know, last year they put the franchise tag on him. There's rumors they are not franchise tagging him this year. They be in Cincinnati, but, you know, never say never, right? So second on the list, you've got Jordan Poyer. Where does Jordan Poyer, Poyer come in? You know, Jordan Poyer, before I looked at this, I would have thought, oh, he's a top five safety in the league, right? According to PFF, he had a down year, 70.2. Now, you guys know he battled injuries, but he grades out as a 70.2 um, this year. Uh, it's 31st amongst safeties. So, obviously, his production has gone down quite a bit. Number three is uh, Jimmy Ward. Jimmy Ward comes in right above Jesse Bates at number 14 with a 75.6. Both of those safeties play the run really, really well and they got a, about the same grade in coverage, uh, too. So, for me, it's all about stopping the run at that safety position. I mean, it's not even comparable, guys. If you look at some of these safeties and then you compare them to what we had at safety this year with Amos and Savage. Savage grading out in the 40s. I think Amos was in the 50s. If you had one of these safeties on your roster, my goodness, what a difference it would have made. Number four, Adrian Amos. So here Adrian Amos comes in. Let's see if we can go down far enough to find him on the PFF grade. He's not even in the top 50 of, of safeties in the entire league. So, um, yeah. Next is Devin McCourty. You know, he comes from New England. Devin McCourty was a great player for a very, very long time. Um, they traded and actually got Jabril Peppers, and then they also added Kyle Duggar through the draft a couple years ago. Everybody freaked out over the Kyle Duggar draft. Who is this guy? He's, you know, Bill Belichick is so cocky, so arrogant, trying to take these small school guys. What does he think he's doing? Kyle Duggar graded out as the ninth best safety in the league at a 78.4. So Bill has done it again. Remember I talked about how Parcell said that Bill Belichick has this endless pool of players that he can pull players from, and he just always finds the perfect guy for the perfect fit. It goes back to scouting them, you know. Uh, coming out of college, and then also scouting, having a scouting department that watches every snap of every player in the league, and you're always ready to pull the trigger, whether it's a trade, free agency, uh, practice squad addition, whatever it might be. But, man, that's why New England's defense was so good this year. Number nine, safety in Kyle Duggar. Number 16, safety in Jabril Peppers, both of which are considered num strong number one safeties at both free safety and strong safety. Um, so as we slide down again, looking for Devin McCourty. Um, there's Adrian Phillips, another safety for the uh, New England Patriots. And then there's Devin McCourty at number 32, a 70.0. How much gas has he got in the tank? That's the question, right? But, again, those are your top five available free agents as it sits right now, barring any franchise tag or renegotiating with their, uh, their team from last year. Let's go to Adrian Amos because that's the most likely person that the Packers will try to sign unless his market heats up. If you click on market value, they're saying that his market value is $6.8 million average annual salary. Okay. So, you know, maybe the Packers let him test free agency and then match an offer. Could be. I'm excited to see how much interest Adrian Amos draws uh, in the free agency frenzy. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, that's what the safety market looks like. Wanted to kind of line up some grades with the financial side. Let's move on to tight end. So tight end, I think, is a huge, huge need. Why are we doing the free agents over before the draft? A lot of people are covering draft coverage right now, right? Because free agency comes before the draft. I would like to touch on it first. Little, uh, you know, pre-primer here. 
for free agency. And then, bang, when we get into March, free agency starts, we'll jump into our draft coverage. We'll just be simply reporting news of the Packers sign this player, the Packers sign that player, the Packers cut this player, and then we're primed up and ready for the draft. So that's kind of how I like to approach it in the order of the calendar. Rather than boring you guys with my mock draft after mock draft after mock draft, I'm going to bring you the free agency news, and then we'll jump into the draft stuff uh, immediately following it. So tied in. The top free agent tight ends that are set to hit the market. Mike Gusecki from Miami, Dalton Schultz from Dallas, Evan Ingram from Jacksonville, Austin Hooper from Tennessee, and Big Bob Tunyon from Green Bay. Those are your top five, okay? Um, you got Hayden Hurst there at six in Cincinnati. That, that one kind of piques my interest a little bit because he's been in Cincinnati and the terminology, the, uh, the structure, the skeleton, if you will, uh, of that offense – um, is pretty much the same as Green Bay's. It's just they choose to do things a little bit different. So those are your top ones. Now, Mercedes Lewis comes down here at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Your 10th best tight end free agent. Everything on social media suggests that Mercedes Lewis is planning on coming back and playing another year in the NFL. Aaron Rodgers said in the interview that I promised I wouldn't play the entire interview for you guys um, out of the listener's respect. Um he said, you know, I, if I do decide to come back, I want Mercedes Lewis beside me on that team. I want this player. I want that player, right? So um, if Mercedes Lewis obviously is planning on coming back, now Green Bay, are they going to make an offer to Mercedes Lewis? Are they going to let him test the market? These are the things that are going to come into play for Aaron's decision too, right? So I think the fact that you've only got one tight end on the team, if Mercedes wants to play, I mean, the dude, you've seen him in Miami. Like, he was – arguably the X factor in Miami. He caught a touchdown pass, if I remember correctly, and he caught that huge wheel route when Aaron made those two defenders miss and threw off-platform sidearm down the sideline. Beautiful play. I think that was on either third or fourth down to move the sticks. Um, so the guy still got it, right? It's just we want one of those starting caliber all-around tight ends, right? So, again, Mercedes Lewis coming in down there around the 10 spot. And you got Bob Tunyon coming in there at the five spot. Now, Mike Gusecki, let's start at the top. Mike Gusecki, the top free agent tied in according to annual average salary. Let's see where he grades out in PFF. For Mike Gusecki, you got to go pretty far down the list here. Looks like, yeah, 41st. He graded out as a 60.5. 60.5 for Mike Gusecki. Okay, let's move on to Dalton Schultz. Where does Dalton Schultz come in? Let's look for that ugly star. There he is, number 17, grades out as a 69.6. So he's uh, significantly higher than uh, than uh, Mike Gusecki. Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram from Jacksonville. Let's see where he comes in. 21st, 67.4. So all these guys are in the same ballpark, right? And then up next, you've got Austin Hooper. Austin Hooper from... I think it was Cleveland. Let's see here if we can find Hooper on this list. Man, is he even on the list? That's not a good sign, is it? Let's see, Austin Hooper. Oh, Tennessee, that's why. All right, so he played at Tennessee. Let's see here. Tennessee, Austin Hooper, 18th, 68.8, right there in the same ballpark. These guys are literally grouped uh, right together, other than uh, the uh, the top one there in Gusecki. Gusecki was uh, pretty far down the list there to 60.5. So, of the free agent tight ends so far, Gasecki, in my opinion, people are going to overpay for, according to PFF. Then you got Dalton Schultz, Evan Ingram, and Austin Hooper are kind of grouped together. I would consider them in the same tier. I would put Gasecki below them on the, the next tier. Let's see where Mercedes Lewis comes in. He comes in 24th, 65.6, so he would be a tier lower than them. So Mercedes actually grades out better than Gasecki, but a little bit lower than the other three tight ends. Okay, So the way the tight end – room is going to shape up here. You need at least three tight ends, in my opinion. The two guys you sign on the futures contract are not, you know, you're not planning on them playing on a Sunday, right? Maybe in a pinch. And there's a chance that you bring back Tyler Davis as well. I know that doesn't excite people, but I could see that being a goody move for sure. But the three that catch my eye are Dalton Schultz, Evan Ingram, and Austin Hooper. Uh, Bob Tunyon comes in next. Just to put that into perspective, we have Bob Tunyon on the, uh, on the roster all year long, right? Let's see if we can find him here on this list. He did not make the top 50. That's how bad Bob Tunyon was this year. I would personally like to see him move on from Bob Tunyon, re-sign Mercedes Lewis. You'll be able to get him for you know little to nothing, 
and um, then go after either Dalton Schultz, Evan Ingram, or Austin Hooper. Those would be kind of the three to choose from. Now, that doesn't mean you overpay, right? So what is the market value? Let's go to the very top one in Dalton Schultz. He's 26 years old, okay? So let's see what Dar Dalton Schultz's market value is. And according to Spotrack, 15.1 million annual salary. I don't know about you guys, but I ain't doing that. <laughs> I'm not paying Dalton Schultz $15 million annual salary, right? So let's slide down and take a look at Mercedes Lewis. They don't even have the market value up for him. Of course, his was 2.9, probably around the same, 2 or $3 million, um, that veteran minimum for how many years he's been in the league. So that's kind of how that sits. Let's go to Bob Tunyon. Bob Tunyon was only 3.7, right, according to an annual average salary. They're saying 5.1 is his number. I want to say it's reasonable, but, man, he played so bad. Um, I'm just kind of ready to move on from Bob Tunyon unless he tests the market and comes back and you're getting him for darn near a, a veteran minimum. I could see that being worth it. So that's how the tight end room shapes up as far as free agency goes and which way, which direction the Packers may go. Now let's move on to wide receiver. Um, you guys have heard me talk about this in the past. Uh, I, I'm now a believer that you got to have a number one wide receiver. Not only do you have to have a number one wide receiver, you're going to have to have a couple. You know, when you look at – let's look at the playoff teams, and I'm just kind of briefly, you know, going through my mind who made the playoffs this year. When you think of Tampa, you've got – uh, Mike Evans, you got Chris Goblin, right? Two number one receivers. In Dallas, what do you got? You've got Michael Gallup, you got CD Lamb, right? And I don't even know if those, I know CD's healthy. I don't know if Gallup's healthy. I believe he is, but you've also got Dalton Schultz, but two number one wide receivers. Um, you know, look at, uh, you know, Cincinnati, what do you got? You got Jamar Chase, right? A solid number one receiver. All the way across the board, you can look at every team that's advanced. You know, Miami made it to the playoffs. They get beat out by the Bills, which that was a really fun game to watch. Really surprised me. But what did you have in Miami? Jalen Waddle and Tariq Hill, two number one wide receivers. You also had Gusecki, but that might be why Gusecki's numbers dipped is because you added those two stud – you got two stud wide receivers on your roster now. That kind of might be why um, he graded out a little bit lower. But – um, another team, Buffalo, what do you got? Stephon Diggs and Gabriel Davis. Like you can go on and on and on down the line. And there's number one receivers in all of these playoff teams' rosters. Now, if you look at Green Bay, would you consider Christian Watson a number one wide receiver? If he continues what he did last year, absolutely. But why stop there? Go get another number one receiver, right? Or at least a number two. Dobbs may be that. If Dobbs is a number two receiver and you go out and get a number two, and taking advantage of the fact that our roster, there is hardly any money at all being spent on wide receiver, right? And I think personally, if Cobb decides to come back and play and not retire and Aaron returns, I think Cobb will be back on the roster, which I'm totally cool with. Cobb played good last year. He did. And he had his role diminished. Now, Alan Lazard, what's he going to demand if he tries to hit free agency? I wouldn't mind to have Lazard back, but it's nowhere near what the open market's probably willing to spend on him, to be honest. Um, but we'll see how that goes. So let's go to the top free agents um, when it comes to Spo Track here. You got Nelson Aguilar, Sterling Shepard, DJ Shark, Randall Cobb, Marvin Jones, Julio Jones, Byron Pringle, Alan Lazard, Jacoby Myers. Who stands out to me there? There's a Juju Smith Schuster. Um, not a whole lot, right? Nelson Aguilar's had drop problems. He's supposed to be a deep threat. He never became that in. In New England, I, I watched that firsthand. He's going to turn 30 this year. Sterling Shepard's going to turn 30. I've never been really impressed with him. But let's look at the grades. Let's see if we can find them. Nelson Aguilar, right, for New England. Let's see how he graded out this year. There's Jacoby Myers. There's Devontae Parker. He's not even in the top 50. So I wouldn't be interested in Aguilar. Sterling Shepard, right, for the Giants. Let's see where he ended up. Let's comb through here. There's Richie James on the list. There is Isaiah Hodges on the list. No Sterling Shepard in the top 50. Okay. DJ Shark, 26 years old, obviously played in Detroit this year. DJ Shark, let's see how he graded out. I didn't hear much about him this year. Obviously, Amon Ross St. Brown was the, the big darling. There you've got Khalif Raymond uh, coming in at 38 for the Lions. 
And then you got DJ Shark at 48. So he's grading out as a 69.6. To put that into perspective, guys, um, that's uh, that's kind of what we expected Alan Lazard to grade out. Well, here, here's you a good example. DJ Shark's a totally different receiver from Randall Cobb. But Randall Co Cobb graded out as a 70.1. DJ Shark graded out as a 69.6. So you can kind of see there, right? Christian Watson, I love seeing it, man. 77.1. I grin every time his name pops up because, man, it's looking like he is a number one wide receiver, which is really, really exciting. So we already covered Cobb. He comes in as a 70. Then you got Marvin Jones from Jacksonville. Let's see, uh, see if he lands on the list here anywhere. Marvin Jones, Marvin Jones. There's Christian Kirk. Everybody bashed them for signing him, and he made a big difference this year. Um, yeah, Marvin Jones is not in the top 50. Isn't that wild? That's amazing. Um, Julio Jones, 33 years old. I'm not even going to look it up. I don't want Julio. That's just me personally. Alan Lazard, 27 years old. Um, I don't think he's in the top 50. I didn't see him there anywhere. No, so he's not even in the top 50. So when you look at those free agents that we just listed off, who would you be interested in, man? Who would you be interested in adding to the locker room? The one that stands out to me is Randall Cobb. Randall Cobb. Guys, this is – the pieces are falling into place. For To me, it seems like Aaron is leaning towards returning. And I would also see Goody bring back Cobb and Mercedes Lewis. If you do that, you now have four wide receivers on the roster and two tight ends. So what's that leave you with? When you looked at the free agent market for uh, tight ends, first of all, you didn't get your number one receiver. I don't see anybody on the, this list that I'd be like, yep, go get them. That's the one, right? I mean, let's look at let's look at Jacoby Myers because he's 26 years old. He is one of my favorite Patriot players. I feel like he plays the game the right way. Um, he's 29th. That's a starting caliber at 75.6. Now, the issue with signing a wide receiver free agent is what? Last year, we seen the wide receiver market get so inflated, it's not even funny. You know, we said it about Christian Kirk. I was one of the people going, why did they overpay for Christian Kirk? That's crazy. He was their number one receiver all year long. He uh, he grades out pretty well right here at a, at a 30, basically solidifying the fact that he is a starting number one, a number one starting caliber wide receiver, right? And they're in the playoffs because they've got a number one receiver. Okay. So, you know, it, it's tough for me. I don't want to overpay for players, but the only person I'm seeing on this list that I would say, hey, man, go make a run at would probably be Jacoby Myers. Now, Jacoby Myers, some people would consider him a slot receiver. I've seen enough of him to know that he can play all three positions. It's just I believe he's a little undersized, if I remember correctly. Let me click on his profile here if it'll show it. Um, no, he's actually, uh, actually a lot bigger, six, six foot two, 200 pounds. So – you know, when you look at his PFF grades, too, you kind of, you know, what you see is what you get. 64.7 in 2019. Then he went 78.6, 74.7, 75.6. He's 26 years old. I think he's going to make some bank. If the Patriots don't re-sign him, he's going to drive the market there a little bit for the wide receivers, in my opinion. Um, so would it be worth it for Green Bay to go after Jacoby Myers? I could see that. Now, how does he fit schematically? You guys remember the big hiccup for the New England Patriots this year was they switched to that McVay style of wide zone boot scheme, right? They wanted to go to that look. Now, they've got a lot of RPO stuff, too. They got really frustrating, especially out of the gun that we even seen in Green Bay this year. You guys have heard me talk about it all year long on the pod. Um, when it comes to their offense, that should be a pretty easy transition. Terminology might be a little bit different, but essentially – you're looking to accomplish the same thing in there. Now, you shift, obviously, to the 49ers style. That does come into play a little bit, the fact that if the Packers do start to lean into Kyle Shanahan's version rather than Sean McVay's version, then you're going to see a lot more 21 personnel than 11 personnel. Not that you're going to run 21 more than 11. It's just you've been so 11 personnel heavy and 12 personnel heavy in the past, you'll probably shift to a lot more 21 looks. So with that being said, you need two receivers in the lineup, right? Um Adding a Jacoby, uh, Jacoby Myers would help quite a bit. So I think of everything that we've seen here, I would want to see Cobb back. Uh, obviously at a reasonable price. I don't think he'll drive the market up crazy. I think he wants to be in Green Bay with Aaron. If he does not retire, he being Cobb, but also if if Aaron doesn't retire. But the one receiver that's sticking out to me is, uh, is Jacoby Myers. 
So I'm going to mark him on the list here that that's probably the one that I would be most interested in uh, as far as free agents at the wide receiver position. So what's that leave you with, guys? When you look at the tight end position, you bring back Mercedes, you got two holes to fill, right? So now you've got two tight end spots you need to fill. And then you've got, if you bring back Cobb, you've only got one wide receiver spot to fill. Not to say that you won't carry six or seven. You never know what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, yeah, I kind of feel like I'm leaning towards um, you would probably – probably have room and free agency to shop around for two tight ends and a wide receiver. And then obviously you're going to try to draft the best player available uh, in the draft. And all of that's going to be based on, you know, the time that you spent and who you scouted for and that type of thing. So, um, you know, what positions you scouted. So two tight ends and one wide receiver. I like Jacoby Myers. Um, Remember on the tight end side, I've already closed the tab out, but we had three there. Dalton Schultz was kind of right there at the top. Um, you had uh, two others listed there with him. So there's a little bit of a tight end market. I think you bring back Mercedes Lewis. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of how the uh, the draft is shaping up already, right? So when you look at the safety position, um, I kind of see them looking to let Adrian Amos test the market and then try to get a deal on him back. I'm not a huge fan, but that's what I'm seeing. Now, if Jesse Bates hits free agency and the Packers want to get really, really aggressive, Jesse Bates is a great player. He's proven it. You know, I heard Aaron last or uh, I heard Ryan last offseason talk about it. Right. He talked a lot about Jesse Bates and how he's probably going to get franchise tag. Um, and, and essentially that's that's exactly what happened. So um, those are your positions, man. You're going to need you're going to need two safeties and uh, at least two safeties. I'd say two safeties, two tight ends and a wide receiver is kind of what the early goings are are shaping up to be. So. That's what we're going to focus on in the draft as of right now. In the meantime, we're going to keep an eye on these free agents and see if anything shakes out. If they, if there's rumors that they plan on getting franchise tagged, or if you know sometimes it leaks out the team's just going to let them walk and test free agency. Uh, other times it's leaked out that they're negotiating behind the scenes and looking to give them a contract extension. There's a lot of different things that could take place. So um, that's kind of how I see it. So those are the three positions that I would really be keyed in on. The top two being safety and tight end and wide receiver as we get ready for the draft. So. That's all we're going to cover on the show today. I went really, really long the last couple of times, so I want to get you guys out of here um, at a really reasonable time here today. Um, Really appreciate you taking time to hang out with us. Uh, We will be back. Let's see, today is Tuesday. So if nothing changes, we'll be back on Thursday uh, to talk about any other news that might have broke and kind of get into a a little more Packers talk. So I just want to thank you guys so much for taking the time to hang out with us, making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world and go Pack Go. On the fake, Rodgers lets it fly, has Watson, he's got it on his feet and he's in for the touchdown! That might be the biggest catch of this young receiver's career. Christian Watson, you can see him, it's just press man. They talk about his speed, his ability to get behind the defense. It's just a matter of can he catch it. That's a great job tracking the ball. He just took a big sigh of relief. Look at his buddies greeting him on the sideline, man. That's got to feel good.